If you're interested to learn about the latest about the H2B visa as, as it's happening in DC right now, um, I'm just leaving the Seasonal Employment Alliance uh, day two, uh, a day filled with speakers from all across the stakeholder spectrum of, of the H2 visa. So from the employers to the recruiters, to the attorneys, to the government officials um, at the various labor ministries across the world that deal with this program. If that sounds interesting, I'll see you after the break. So uh, here's something that uh, the biggest topic of conversation today by far uh, is number one, um, how do we stabilize the H2B program so it's not a crapshoot, you know, so we don't have lotteries so that we can predict when H2 workers are coming in. This has been a, a problem for years. Like, how do we fix that so it can actually become a viable program? Uh, number two, are we going to get an, an additional allotment of workers for uh, the first half of the 2021-2022 fiscal year? Okay, so let's start in reverse order. The answer to the second question is, things look good. As of last week, we were all down because what's happening is that instead of passing an omnibus bill or passing a spending bill, what's happening right now is that we have continuing resolution after continuing resolution, which basically means that instead of creating a new budget for the government, the old budget is getting rolled over. That's bad news for some agencies like the Department of Labor because they've been trying to increase the number of people that they actually have on payroll so that they can deal with a historic increase in H-2 applications, not just H-2Bs, which this channel deals with, but H-2As. Last year, we saw 319,000 H-2A applicants enter the country. The year before that, 275,000. We're looking at another 17% increase for the 2022 year. Department of Labor simply doesn't have enough people to keep up, although they say they're doing the best they can. And of course, H-2Bs have set record after record after record. This year, based on internal surveys, um, our Seasonal uh, Employment Alliance um, kind of uh, partners, everybody that, that, that's a part of this organization, there's gonna be a 42% increase in H-2B applicants, which is super close to what I predicted at the start of the H-2B series. So we are expecting 130 to 140,000 uh, visas are gonna be requested for this year. But anyhow, we saw 100% increase year on year in fiscal year 2021, October 1st cycle. It looks like there's gonna be 12,000 visas or so possibly allotted, and we're gonna know by the end of this week. Department of Homeland Security has uh, jurisdiction over that, and so we're waiting for good news this week on whether or not those additional visas are awarded. If we get more visas than that, or if all those visas aren't used, um, we're anticipating that they might even get rolled over to the April cycle, so the April cycle itself might start with more visas. <gasps> Let me back up, I'm trying to film this on a busy street. What I'm saying is, the fiscal year, good news for fiscal year 2021-2022, cycle one, the October cycle, is that it does sound like there's a lot of good progress on getting additional visas, perhaps as many as 12,000, perhaps more. Um, there's gonna be a 42% increase uh, based on a survey. The, the survey prediction is a 42% increase in um, applicants for the April cycle. Um, and so then there's this question of how do we stabilize? Well, right now there's two bills. We're looking at a Senate bill that's co-sponsored by uh, Senators Manchin and Senator uh, Graham. And we're looking at a House bill that is um, being sponsored by, let me just look through my notes. And then the second bill, the House bill, is by Re uh, Representative Kular, Henry Kular, from a Democrat from Texas who's actually a moderate. The issue with these bills is that while during the Trump presidency, we had the far right led by Stephen Miller that was intent on just getting rid of all immigration. On the Democratic side, we have union and pro-labor interests which really don't like the H-2 program to the point where the Department of Labor seems to have become uh, the antagonistic agency as far as the H-2 program is concerned. That's the flip of the Trump administration when DHS was antagonistic and the Department of Labor was friendly. And so it's just really interesting to listen to this interplay because in order for the program to uh, really be functional. You both need the Department of Labor and the DHS to play ball. So as it is, to create any fixes, we're really start. Uh, we're really stuck with doing two things. Number one, trying to fix systemic issues, like the way that we do recruitment in Northern Triangle countries, the way that, uh, you know, we deal with COVID-19 uh, vaccine mandates across the world, and then appropriations bills, which are kind of this backdoor to creating legislation. So those are the two things we're stuck with. It doesn't bode well for the near-term future of the program, but maybe in the long term, you know, we're gonna see, we're gonna see some changes. 
Um, what we know though, definitely for this season is we're not seeing any changes. So we have to be prepared, you know, to move forward as is. Big picture wise, big picture wise, what are we seeing? Big picture wise, you know, one of the other conversations that I didn't mention at the top of the hour, but which is important to understand is, you know, which country do you recruit from this year because of that COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, issue. The issue is that anybody entering uh, the U.S., whether it's from air uh, or over land, has to take a show a COVID negative test within 24 hours of entering, and they have to have shown that they've uh, fully been vaccinated with an MOH or meaning, uh, excuse me, a WHO, World Health Organization, or a U.S. CDC uh, vaccine. Now, some countries that H2Bs are, are coming from, uh, particularly the Northern Triangle don't have uh, good records for people as to which vaccines have been taken. And some people, for example, have taken the Russian Sputnik vaccine, which is not WHO or CDC approved or recommended. Um, some people have taken a mix of vaccines and they might not have documentation. So it remains to be seen how this is gonna be handled at the border, but it all points to anticipating delays about when workers are coming in of an additional few weeks. Add to this fact that uh, countries like Mexico, which have a developed infrastructure for H2 workers are saying that, hey, we might not have enough vaccines for all this H2A workers that you're coming in. If you send in 400,000 H2A workers, we might not have enough um, tests for them, like swab tests. Uh, we might not have, we, 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 we might be really hard for us to check everybody's vaccination records. That could also add to delays. And then you have all sorts of transportation issues due to supply chain backlogs, due to a buildup of immigrants trying to enter the country. At, um, at the U.S.-Mexico border, which might actually make transportation tough. Oh, there's so much to unpack, but what I'm gonna be trying to do is put this together in an email. Maybe I'll put it up as a public blog post. Uh, but suffice to say, this is gonna be a season like no other. Uh, and I really wanted to be here in D.C. this year so I could um, you know, understand the minutia of, of what's going on. So that's my update for now. I gotta head to the airport. I'm gonna be putting up a video each week, each day this week, uh, uh, dissecting some of what I've just kind of uh, thrown into here. So I, I apologize for the kind of rattling, but I just wanted to uh, get something up for you um, so you know what's up. All right, thanks so much for watching. If you made it this far, subscribe. I'll talk to you soon.